crasses and eloquent things I will come to in the fullness of time. Um, I should explain how I come to be here because uh, I'm not, or I wasn't trained to be a museum person. I was trained as an art historian. Um, and this is the sort of thing that I look at. I can't see this. Uh, Donatello's entombment at the Santo in Padua. And I'm interested in a number of ways. I'm interested in it because Donatello is Donatello and the greatest artist who ever lived in any medium at any time or in any place. And I'll take anybody outside <laughs> who wants to argue with that. And I'm interested in it because it expresses something about uh, faith. It expresses something about the traditions of that place, that church, the Franciscans who run it. It expresses something about Donatello himself, but also because it has a surface of deep interest. And polyphony is my um, special interest. That is to say, I'm archaeologically interested in the stratification of layers of applied media to the surfaces of sculpture. I'm not going to go through this. This is just to say that I believe in looking at objects as closely as we possibly can. And really, that's at the heart of the work that I'm involved with at the Ashmolean, is to encourage my colleagues in the university and their students to look as closely as they can at the collections of the museum, at individual objects. Not necessarily because those objects are in any way pertinent to their research or even to the disciplines in which they work, but because I think that there is in the museum the potential to encourage people to think about evidence in a different way, to think about how they uh, apprehend the evidence that is in front of them when they're adducing it to an argument. The ways in which uh, they read texts, therefore, can be transformed by the ways in which they look at objects. And the ways in which uh, they construct arguments, likewise, can be transformed. This is the kind of object that I use, these kind of slightly unpromising pieces of uh, migration period metalwork very often. Um, this is one which I was using this week with a group of, fairly obviously actually, um, students in the English faculty who were working on the early English paper. Literature in English, 650 to 1350. The fact that it is a girdle is in a sense neither here nor there, what we do with this is spend 45 minutes as a group looking at it and not telling them what it is or what it's made of or how it was made or where it came from or any of the things that might be pertinent to the object, but instead asking them to construct that knowledge together by looking. So they handle the object. They tell me what they can see. I ask them gradually to start inferring things on the basis of what they see. And by and large, they are able to come to an understanding of the materials and manufacture of the object such that they can describe the tools that were used to make it, such that they can think about the team of people that might have been involved in its manufacture, such that they can say something about its long history from its manufacture to the point of looking at it in the classroom. And this process of shared knowledge construction is at the heart of everything that I do in the museum as the teaching curator at Rashmoni. Being the teaching curator essentially places me between the collections and the curriculum of the university. So my uh, desire is to be open enough that when my colleagues come to me from any given discipline, and say, could we do this? I would say yes, and then work out how we might do it. Um, because I think it's in that way that we encourage people to engage with our collections. There are some parts of the university that have done that very thoroughly. The English faculty is one, modern language is another, history is another, obviously those humanities disciplines. But I also work extensively in neurology and psychiatry and with theologians and various others, geographers all of whom are using the collections in ways which are specific, but also in this way, which is to say, in a way which is asking of their students that they think seriously about whatever it is in front of them. This, I think, has a number of advantages and a number of <clears throat> useful outcomes in terms of teaching more generally. I would argue that the object-centered classroom 
where you gather a group of students around a thing and ask them to examine it, has the potential to be a very different kind of teaching space from a teaching space which is gathered around a text. There's a number of reasons for this. At any university, and you will all be familiar with this, there are students who arrive not quite fully formed as if they'd sprung from the head of Zeus, but who arrive having been taught from an early age that their voice is of value and having been taught that the discursive approach to teaching and learning is the necessary one. And those students are confident in the class and they are able to speak and willing to speak and therefore they do speak and they speak at great length. There are other students that come who have been taught in a manner which suggests that they are a receptacle for information, which is then to be regurgitated in order for them to progress to whatever is the next stage of their education. And for those students, being asked simply to comment on something is a more problematic question. Not for all of them, but for some of them. And there is amongst those students a kind of reticence in the classroom, which is very often uh, trampled over by those more voluble students who are used to talking. If you place an object in front of a group of students and you ask them simply to tell you what they can see, and you then constrain what they're allowed to tell you, that is to say, you ask them to tell you one thing, then that question of difference between those two groups of students is to some extent obviated. Not entirely. People are still shy. People are still uh, reluctant to speak sometimes, but gradually, as you move around a group of 12 students or 10 students talking about an object, people begin to develop confidence in what they're saying because what they can see is just as valuable as what anybody else can see. Or in the case of a student who is partially sighted, what they can feel, what their sensory engagement is. And therefore, although it sounds like a very grand claim, almost to the point of uh, unsustainability, I would argue that the object-centered classroom is a democratic teaching space in a way that very few are, because every voice becomes part of the creation of knowledge around the object. And once you've started to create knowledge around one object, then you do it more easily with the next one. And therefore, if you work with a group of 12 objects or five objects or six objects, by the end of the class, you have a collaborative group of people who are working together and whose knowledge is not the possession of one or other of them, but the possession of the group as a whole. What you're looking at here is uh, an image of a uh, session yesterday in the study room that I use at the Ashmolean um, during this thing called crisis, which I'm coming on to. And what we've got here are eight undergraduates and taught postgraduates and four doctoral candidates and postdocs who are all working under the direction of the man at the back in the blue shirt, just under the clock, who is a postdoc in medieval German. And they are thinking about the idea of container. And they're thinking about that idea from the point of view of his research, Linus's research. Mm -hmm. And his research is largely on dismembered things, dismembered books, dismembered manuscripts, the ways in which those dismemberings are either then reconnected in different ways by collectors or the ways in which they are able to be reconnected in terms of putting back together texts that have been separated from their images, for example. So that's what's going on there. We're looking at four books in the museum. This kind of teaching has delivered to the Ashmolean something new over the last 10 years or so, uh, which is to say, an engagement with disciplines that have never been previously interested in the museum. We've always had classicists, we've always had archaeologists. Some historians, surprisingly few art historians, but beyond that, not many. And most of those classicists and archaeologists were coming to work in the galleries rather than in the study rooms, because partly because the resource is limited, but partly because there's an easy win for taking your students to the gallery, looking at things that are already interpreted already on display and already accessible to you. Over the last 10 years, we've been building a practice which enables us to do more than that. 
this is from our last full year of teaching, which looking back is a long time ago. We are getting back towards these numbers. We're teaching across the university um, in everything from mathematics to uh, art history. And um, we're dealing with other kinds of public engagement with research where graduate students give talks, where podcasts are being made, where small exhibitions are being uh, curated in collaboration with both colleagues on faculty and with students. So this is a kind of exciting thing which has come about from developing this practice. From my own point of view, that practice began with this object. Um, I was uh, at the portal um, during my PhD teaching a course uh, called Writing on Sculpture, which was about literally the writing we find on pieces of sculpture rather than things that people have written about sculpture. And I wanted there to be a piece of sculpture in the room, and I wanted it to have writing on it. And this is what I had to hand. And so I brought this into a teaching context of 11 very intelligent and articulate third year undergraduates who were used to dealing with objects. And I asked them each to observe something about the thing. And after we'd been around the room once, nobody had said it is black. And it struck me that people look at things without apprehending anything about them, other than the thing that they think they already know. If you can look at an object and not even notice its colour, if 10 of you, 11 of you can look at an object and not notice its colour, then it's clearly something which is lacking in people's apprehension of the world around them. So I thought this would be a worthwhile path to follow. And so I have followed it. And the way I would think about objects now, that's alarming. But that's fine. Um, the way I think about objects now is that having seen the same objects, having seen the same objects working with different kinds of people, I've come to recognize that they possess a quality which I would describe as agility. An object is capable of orienting itself to the gaze of whoever is looking at it. The object will surrender in terms of its interpretation to whatever interrogation you choose to place it under. That means that one object can be useful to everybody, or alternatively, any object can be useful to anybody. This little um, copper alloy pit, it's a container for the host at the mass, and the facts of it are here. It's copper alloy, it was enameled and gilded, it was made in the Mojo around 1200. It's knackered, we have a much lovelier one on display in the museum, as does pretty well any museum in Europe that has a medieval collection, because lots of these were produced. This one is useful, though, because it is knackered, because when you start to look at it, you can see how it was made. You can understand its materials. If you have never encountered enamel before, you can understand what enamel is because you can see that it breaks and doesn't wear. There are ways of looking at this which enable people who don't know about materials to understand materials. And then you can have a conversation about all sorts of things. These are some of the conversations that we might have around the pics. We'll talk about its physical history. We'll talk about its function as a devotional object. We'll talk about the techniques of its manufacture, its iconography, its value, the way it has changed in function over time from being a liturgical thing to being a collected thing. And then once you start having those conversations, more people want to have them because they form networks of discussion, which draw people who are perhaps in the same discipline, but with different interests. They are drawn together. And then you begin to see who might be interested in talking about it. So this is an object which I've used in teaching in these disciplines that surround the thing now. It's extraordinary how uh, presented with a thing about which they know nothing, people will find a way to understand it and then find a way to relate that understanding back into the world that they inhabit. But what's interesting is, whereas these are all classes I've taught with faculty members and students, these are the disciplines of early career scholars who have come to the museum and worked with me with the object. And as you can see, they represent a far wider span of disciplines. And it is amongst early career scholars that this practice 
the teaching of the Yashmani has become most uh, effective and useful. Partly because as they develop a teaching practice of their own, they are looking for something which will mark them out from everybody else that is competing for the same jobs. This is understandable. This is a useful skill to develop. And partly it's because some of them have come through these programs over the last decade. So as undergraduates, they've experienced this, and now it's their desire to give that experience back to the people that they are teaching. Now, this is a problem because teaching with actual objects in a study room is a very labor intensive and resource intensive thing to do. There is not one square inch of the Ashmolean, which is dedicated to university teaching. We have a learning studio for schools. We have study rooms in each of the curatorial departments, which are broadly used by independent researchers, by people in the university, by teachers in the university, but there is no room where I can turn up in the morning and guarantee that I'll be able to teach a class there on any given day. So I'm competing for space. Anybody else who wants to teach in the museum is competing in that very same small marketplace. So offering this skill is tricky. There are a number of ways which we try to address that difficulty. Part of it is simply training people to work with objects such that the skill can be transferred out of the Ashmole into another context. Because I believe very strongly that this is not reliant on having Britain's greatest collection of Egyptology or three million insects at your disposal. I think this is a practice which is dependent on knowing how to ask the question of the student, which will elicit an answer that will contribute to the creation of knowledge. So that's what we teach. And this course, Eloquent Things, is the principal mechanism by which we do this. It runs twice a term. It lasts for four mornings. It requires the commitment of uh, the participants to be there from Tuesday to Friday, three hours each morning, in order to simply get an idea of what object-based teaching is, to get an idea of the practicalities of being in a museum, to have some sense of what it means to handle things, of what things are good for handling, what things are not good for handling, when to say no, those practical questions. But then the course also asks them to prepare two short pieces of teaching, one in collaboration with a scholar from another discipline, and one on their own to be delivered in the galleries. So we think about the challenges that change when you step outside the study room and into public space, which you will be familiar with. The challenges are mostly that there are 47 year olds right there and they're shouting, or that you're teaching here and there are seven elderly people behind you who think that you're giving a public talk. And so when you ask a question, they want to answer it. And these kinds of things are likely to be the challenges that my colleagues, my own career colleagues, will face because they will be in the galleries. Because there's no limit on what you can do in the gallery. You can just turn up with the students and do something. But they need to be prepared for that. So Eloquent Things runs twice a term, uh, once for the Social Sciences Division as part of their doctoral training programme and once for the Humanities Division as part of their doctoral training programme. Although postdocs are also welcome onto the course and so it stretches a little further. The problem with eloquent things, as with all of this, is that once you've done it, how do you get then the chance to teach? How do you gain the experience that you need in order to develop this practice, to embed it in your own way of working? These are eloquent things people uh, doing a piece of gallery teaching to each other, actually. I should have gone to that before because it's a much more interesting slide than the one with all the words on it, but never mind. The thing which, which we've developed in order to offer an opportunity to teach is this thing called praxis. Praxis, as those of you who are classicists will know, is a Greek word which means a good mix. It refers perhaps to the mix of water and wine at the symposium. And it was named praxis by the classicist with whom uh, I began the program, who was called Sam Gardner. And uh, Sam and I conceived of this as a way of bringing together a group of early career scholars with a group of undergraduates and taught postgrads, such that, as we saw earlier, they might address a common theme 
over the course of the whole term, build relationships, see how that theme might be addressed differently from different research perspectives and different disciplines, and offer to the undergraduates not just a learning experience each week, but also the chance to see a research path, to be mentored to some degree by somebody just a few years further down the track than they are, in order that they might perhaps think about what their own future might hold. So every term practice involves eight early career scholars and 16 undergrads and postgrads, and we divide them into two groups. And each group meets three times by itself, and then twice a term, the whole lot comes together and we do something uh, en masse. What we do depends entirely on who is leading any given week. And what the theme is depends on what the early career scholars decide before the term begins. So the themes are theirs. The content of each week is theirs. My role is to facilitate, to advise on what objects might be suitable, on what we can and can't do in the museum, and to help them to construct this, what is effectively a three hour symposium. Three hours is a long time to ask people to listen and engage. So we have tea in the middle, which is very Oxford, you know, tea in the middle. And the way it was, oh, this is just stuff about classes. You can find this actually. If you go to, um, uh, I don't know whether this is going to work, but it might do. Oh, look. Oh, we have a blog for Crassus now, which is written by the undergrads and taught postgrads uh, and that happens after each session um, <clears throat> so each term there's a new block of them and sometimes we miss a week because sometimes uh, they don't get it done but uh, we are gradually building this as a resource and this is a place you can go to find out what it is that we're doing uh, if I uh, I'm nervous about closing this in case I close everything no there we are back again Good. So the other place you can find out about practice is, um, is that we tweet it. So we live tweet during each session. Oh no, can't do that one. So if you follow us at Ashmolean Crassus, then you'll find uh, more news about that. And uh, that is kept up. So to give you an example of what we might do, last term our thing was reuse. And one of the teaching fellows is a doctoral student in the Ministry of Art Department who works on uh, hygiene politics um, in contemporary Chinese art and the ways in which hygiene politics have determined boundaries between people. And her interest, their interest, I'm sorry, in running the session was to think about the way we map things and to think about the way maps are reused and reconfigured to embrace new information, to uh, restore balances of power, and to change the way we see the world. So we began by looking at some maps from the collection. So we have Pyrenees map for example, Marzio. In Rome, we have uh, copy of Ortiz's Theatrum uh, Terrarum, and we have a map of the Battle of Leipzig, which, for which we asked the question, is this a map? In fact, we ask the question of all these, is this map? How are they maps? How are they different from one another? But after that, we started to think about the work of Margaret Wickens Pierce and her work amongst the Penobscot Nation in uh, Maine, in New England, but also across North America in renaming maps, in restoring to maps the place names of uh, the First Nations of that continent. And so we thought about maps as a tool for decolonizing. And then we thought about our own map of the Ashmolean and why it is that on the Ashmolean plan, none of the study rooms exist. So the Ashmolean plan describes a museum of two halves, a museum of public interaction and a museum of private university interaction, which no one's allowed to know about, which is a problem if you're teaching in a study room because my colleagues don't know how to get there. And this all sounds very clean. We've been in the galleries looking at things. We've been in the study room. We've been uh, in discussion as one would be in any other kind of seminar about written material and visual material. And so we also do things like this, which is to say we take the Ashmolean map and we cut it up 
and we asked each of the little groups within the crisis team uh, to reconceive the Ashmolean map as they might want to out of their own experience and discipline. And so we got a map which was conceived by two dyspraxic students to describe the danger of walking around a museum containing fragile things. We got a map which was about access, a map which could be expanded out simply to show you where you could get from floor to floor. And we got a map which described how you might travel around the museum composing a piece of music, which was done by a uh, postdoc in musical composition. These kinds of uh, activity are what crisis comprises. What it comprises on a more substantive level, I think, is it comprises an exercise in building relationship across disciplines between early career scholars and researchers. It comprises an exercise in belonging for students who should own the museum, but who very seldom do own the museum because they're very seldom given the opportunity to own the museum. And overall, it gives a chance to experiment, to explore, to do things which otherwise one might not have the chance to do. I mean, we've done all sorts of things. There's just a slide here. Out of this, uh, a scholar in the music faculty works on circus and contemporary opera, did a thing about extreme bodies in performance. And we looked at Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, a scholar of medieval Japanese literature, dressed one of the scholars in a kimono and then took us into the galleries and had us stand silent and motionless for 15 minutes looking at a single object. And if you've ever done that in a museum, it is freaking, not only because it's an exercise in concentration you're not used to, but because it transforms the space around you such that other people recognize that you are doing something special. We dyed things with uh, an anthropologist who works on mud dyeing in contemporary Japan. We looked at resist technique dye samples as a result of that. We look at things that contain difficult images, things from our European colonial past that we seldom want to engage with now. All of these things. And then we have two. That's it. I don't have anything to say apart from that. This is what we do. Well, this is one of the things that we do. And this is what we are striving to engage the early career community in Oxford with, such that they become people who want to use collections. And when they turn up at your universities, I hope that they will use your collections just as they use ours, because that's the point, really. Thank you very much.